Hey everyone, thanks for coming back to the show. This is Trace. We're doing something called Seeker Plus, where we take a really big topic and we break it down into a couple of different episodes so that we can talk about it for a lot longer, let's be honest. Sometimes we find big topics that are too complex to fit into one Seeker episode, so we thought we would create this kind of new format to be able to talk to you about it for a long period of time. No B-roll, no music, just my notes and me and you and the research that we did. This week and also last week, we're talking about personality and personality types. So make sure you watch last Saturday's episode. If you didn't do that, you can go back and do that. There's a link in the description. This Saturday's episode will make sense on its own, but it would be better paired with the other one. So just make sure you watch both. Anyway, today we're talking about personality. We're gonna talk about the tests we use, some of which are real and some of which are crapola. We're gonna talk about some of our favorites and the ones that have been totally debunked. Make sure you subscribe for the episodes. I'm gonna dig super deep into this over the next 15 to 20 minutes. Let's kick into it. So knowing all about the personality types that we talked about in the last episode, type A, B, C, and D, the Myers-Briggs, E, N, F, J kind of personality types and all the different letters and tests that we use and why it's important, today, let's break this down. How do you measure and quantify something as nebulous as personality? Your personality is created over time inside of your brain and by your own experiences, everyone has a different one. So imagine, just for a second, you're a psychologist and you want to figure out how to figure out someone else. You need to create these little tests and boxes and words and labels to try and figure out what's going on inside of their little brain box. Can you do that? Is that possible? Really? Science is actually out on whether there's definitive personality testing. We each have a pretty good sense of our own personalities, just being ourselves and we're around ourselves all the time for the most part. So we have to invent these tests. And the tests are not great. Different people get different results when they take the tests at different times in their lives, but also if they just immediately retook a test, especially one with hundreds and hundreds of questions, you're gonna get a different result. It's just gonna happen. Their personality didn't change between 11 a.m. when they started the first test and noon when they started the second test, right? But they're gonna get a different result because they were feeling a different way. Maybe they were hungry. You know, maybe they were thinking about work before and now they're thinking about something else. Their emotional state, their energy level, their friends, their significant other, all of those things are gonna change how you feel about yourself and thus change, potentially, your personality. So let me give you an example. A sample question from a personality test would be, are you usually highly motivated and energetic? I think you all know the answer to that. Of course I am. Of course I am. Maybe you had caffeine before though, like some coffee or some cocaine or whatever. Got you energetic, if that's your thing. And if you did that, you would answer the question differently than if you were really tired, right? That sample question is subject to your personal feelings at the time. Here's another sample question. Are you more content alone or in a social setting? If you're in a bad mood, you're gonna answer that question, GTFO, I wanna be by myself. But if you're working from home all day or something like that, you've been alone out in the wilderness, maybe you just wanna be around people, just sit at a coffee shop and be around everyone all the time. You know, it just depends on your experiences, even just the experiences you maybe immediately had before the test. So does that make these tests accurate? Not so much. Personalities are often measured with these tests, but calling them tests is actually debated. There's no right or wrong answer to any of these questions, and they're not exactly empirical. You can't repeat the tests again and again and get the same results, right? But that said, there are lots and lots of these. There are two main types of personality tests. There's objective tests, which are more widely used, more trusted. They're self-reported and subject to honesty, which isn't always the best, but still. An example from that would be, I am easygoing. I either strongly agree or I strongly disagree, somewhere in the middle. Then there are projective measure tests. They expose unconscious perceptions with ambiguous stimuli. So you look at a thing and you perceive all of these things, and then you tell the psychologist or the tester how you feel about it. 
The idea is it's revealing underlying thoughts and biases and stuff. It's based on Freudian psychoanalysis. It's highly criticized. It lacks a lot of scientific evidence. However, it's often used, especially in pop culture, films, television, all the time. They love psychoanalysis. It makes for amazing TV. Let me give you an example. The Rorschach inkblot test. You've seen this in television before. You've probably never actually taken one because they're not actually the best. But it's supposedly going to show your inner character. It was invented in 1921. It was found to be unreliable, incomprehensible, often incorrectly diagnoses people with things like schizophrenia or being bipolar. So anyway, Rorschach inkblot test, not awesome, great for TV. Keep that in mind. Neither of these two main types are flawless or fully supported by psychologists. Neither objective or projective measures are perfect, but we're gonna keep going on them anyway. They are two of the main types. Personality tests generally go through phases. They're created, they have an origin, they go through popularity, either through psychologists or the general public, and then they're often discredited, as in they are found to be flawed in some way. So let me give you another example. Graphology. Graphology is handwriting analysis. Again, you've seen it in like 50 or 60 TV shows. It's a projective measure, which if you recall, is an unconscious perception with ambiguous stimuli based on Freudian analysis. It's not the best. But it's supposed to tell people about your character by analyzing your handwriting which if you've ever written anything down, you know your handwriting changes day to day and depending on your mood and how fast you're trying to be or how much paper you have. <laughs> and there's uh, no real science behind it at all. It was founded or originated in the 1600s. It's a sideshow trick for traveling entertainers and it is totally BS. It's been tested extensively. It was first debunked as early as 1930. If your handwriting slants backwards, they tried to say, science says you're cold-hearted. But left-handed people, their writing slants backwards all the time. Are they cold-hearted? I'm sure some lefties are. Are all of them? My mom is left-handed. Jerk. Funnily enough, it actually resurfaced in the mid-1800s and then discredited again. So it went through the whole cycle of origination and popularity and debunking all over again. Uh, and yet it is still seen by some people who are uh, uneducated on this topic. Here's another example of another objective measure. Woodworth's personal data sheet. It was invented during World War I and it was given to soldiers to ID those who were prone to nervous breakdowns, AKA difficulty adjusting to war conditions. It's an objective measure, again, uh, and it, it's over 100 yes or no questions. It was very, very popular during World War I and we couldn't find any studies that were explicitly debunking it, but based on like what you understand about polling and general research with the public, a question with only two answers isn't really the best measure. It doesn't dig in depth into any actual problems. Sort of like a true false test. Does that really indicate well how much someone knows about something? Not particularly. You're just asking them to flip a coin a bunch of times. Pollsters would never use this because you're not giving people real answers. The world isn't black or white, chocolate or vanilla, and nothing else, and that's implied here within this test. The military also didn't see any value or accuracy in this test, so they moved on to another screening system for World War II. Another example of a personality type or test that you may have heard of is phrenology, or you know, the study of the head. Uh, in the 1800s, a guy named Franz Joseph Gall out of Vienna, decided to look at people's heads and figure out if that could tell them a lot about their personality. When looking at the head, if say someone had a large forehead, maybe they had a better memory, according to Mr. Gall. They created a map of skulls supposedly indicating personalities based on certain regions or bumps of the skull. His protege, Johann Kasper Spursheim, took those findings to America where this took off. Ralph Waldo Emerson called Spursheim one of the world's greatest minds. So it was very popular. A few decades later, people actually just laughed it off. President John Quincy Adams even joked about phrenology. So it was debunked 
fairly quickly. So even though there's a lot of failures in personality testing and all of the apparatuses that surround that, there is science behind personality and traits. And the whole point of these is to try and suss out exactly what that means and try and pull into focus a person, a human being's inner thoughts and feelings about all sorts of stuff. There is hard science about the traits, not a lot of hard science on the validity of the tests. And their accuracies are often questioned. So in the last section of this, we mentioned type A versus type B, type C and D and so on and forth. A and B are interesting because they came out of this one study and most people are a bit of each, depending on the situation and very few people are just one or the other. However, follow-up studies did corroborate the findings of the original study. They were done from the 1960s into the 1990s. However, they were later exposed as partially funded by tobacco companies. The Western Collaborative Group Study, the Framingham Study, they were funded in part, again, by cigarette companies. Now, why would they do that? Why would they fund personality studies? There's no obvious or immediate reason or connection between the two. However, type A people might be good to advertise to and get them to pick up smoking to be less nervous. If you're nervous, you smoke, calm down. But you're type A, so you also have a higher incidence of heart attacks. And it takes the blame off of cigarettes, potentially, because you already have this incidence. Put that onto the personality instead. Let's fund a study that can connect the two. So how accurate are those findings? We're not saying they're not accurate. We're not saying that the studies are bad. We're just pointing out that they were funded in part by a company who may have had a vested interest in the outcome. Myers-Briggs is also not seen as super reliable because about 50% of people will get different answers when they retake the test. It's really easy to find this out for yourself. Google, is Myers-Briggs accurate? You will get 2 million results, mainly questioning the reliability. You could also just ask a psychiatrist or a psychologist and they will say, not particularly. Real psychologists don't use tests like these to determine things. When these tests appear, they're not necessarily considered credible diagnostic tools. What they are is jumping off points, conversation starters. They're ways to help patients think about themselves, and they use different tests to analyze different things in different people, but not to categorize our personalities. They are used to diagnose psychiatric illnesses when they do real tests, things like depression and ADHD, impulse control, whether you're bipolar, not whether you're happier when you're by yourself or with your friends at the bar or if you'd be good in a leadership role at your favorite company. That's not what personality tests are for. The question that you might be asking yourself is, if personality tests are everywhere, they're on every street corner, if you will, and yet they're not real, why are they important? The thing is, most psychologists have strong reservations about the popularity of these tests. There's no science, they're not accurate, they're not reliable. Many, many, many know this, but they still like to take the tests. People feel comforted when they're part of a group of people, a group of others that they understand and know. It helps people find and understand themselves and find groups in which they can belong in little tribes that they can say that, oh, I'm one of those, I belong with them. It's a way to be more self-aware of your own personality, which helps you talk to your psychologist if you have one about that personality and what it means. And if you go to your psychologist and you say, I don't wanna be an introvert anymore, or I think my extroversion's getting in the way of blah, 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 the psychologist has a baseline that they can talk to you about. Because those aren't necessarily technical terms in psychology, but it helps them to understand you because you understand you a little bit better. Some people still do use these tests to assess things. Job recruiters, company HR systems, uh, about 80% of Fortune 500 companies use personality tests like the Myers-Briggs for coaching, for development, for team building, because if you have a lot of extroverts and a few introverts, do you want them all on the same team? Do you want to intersperse them between each other? If you have a lot of thinking people, a lot of judging people, a lot of perceiving people, how do you group them based on those Myers-Briggs types? Would that help the teams work together? Nobody really knows. It's not 100% accurate, but it helps, right? It helps. 
Companies use tests like this because they present these simplified views of people. It's easier than taking the time to get to know the intricacies and idiosyncrasies of every single employee and then saying, oh, Josh and Carol really don't work together very well. It'd be much easier to give them a personality test and be like, oh yeah, based on this, I don't think we should put Josh and Carol on the same team. That's so much easier and they can present these assessments to each other and talk about them. They give context. They don't tell you everything. It comes back to what we were saying earlier. These tests are not perfect, but they help you draw a box that you can put yourself in. The box is imaginary. It's not real, but that's okay. That's fine, as long as you know it's not real. Behavioral scientists and human resources groups, they all study behavior. They study personality. But there's no real science and it's not used by professionals and no psychologist is ever gonna have you walk out of their office saying, you are a type A person. However, there are benefits to studying these things from the risk of future diseases to understanding uh, how our thoughts affect our health. Finding genes for personality traits really helps too because it makes people feel a little more grounded. And some say that perhaps someday CRISPR could help here as well, the gene editing technique. Because if we know that there are certain genes tied to certain personality traits that are, say, more apt to cause heart attacks or depression, we could try and switch those genes on and off. Help make all of us feel a little better. It's a game changer. That said, it's, of course, controversial. This topic is obviously huge, and we only got to scratch the surface of it, even with these long episodes, but it's held our attention for so long because it is about us. It helps us understand ourselves better. I'm gonna end here with a quote from Isabel Briggs Myers. Good type development can be achieved at any age by anyone who cares to understand his or her own gifts and the appropriate use of those gifts. Thanks for watching us here on Seeker, or Seeker Plus for this format at least. I'm Trace, you can find me on Twitter at Trace Dominguez, you can find us at Seeker. Let us know in the comments how you feel about using CRISPR to alter your own personality. Pretty crazy, right? And make sure you subscribe so you get more episodes of Seeker every day. Let us know also in the comments if you like this format, if you like this idea, and we'll see you next time.